News and views beyond the mainstream media. Did you know that the water you're drinking may contain over 2,000 different contaminants? From hormone-disrupting and mind-altering chemicals like fluoride and pharmaceuticals to newly emerging contaminants like radiation and other hybrid chemicals that water treatment plants don't screen out of our drinking water. PureEffectFilters.com has a breakthrough filter solution to effectively reduce the widest range of such contaminants, including the radiation coming from the Fukushima disaster. In addition, the filters will also revitalize your water by releasing natural minerals and electrolytes while increasing pH and antioxidant levels. Safeguard and revitalize your drinking water today with a breakthrough Pure Effect water filter system. Visit PureEffectFilters.com to learn more or contact us today at 1-888-891-4821. That's 1-888-891-4821 or visit PureEffectFilters.com to learn more. You're listening to the Earth Needs Rebel Show, live from Dublin, Ireland, with your host, Kevin Bull. Join the rebels at freethinkingvoice.org. Apply to take the Rebel platform by emailing the rebels at the Earth Needs Rebel Show at freethinkingvoice.tv. The higher you build your barriers, the taller I become. The farther you take my rights away, the faster I will run. You can deny me, you can decide to turn your face away. No matter, cause there's something inside so strong. I know that I can make it. No, you're doing me wrong, so far. You thought that my pride was gone. Hello listeners, welcome to Three Thinking Voice, the Earth Needs Rebel Show, broadcast on Orion Talk Radio from Tonawanda, New York, 1650 on the AM, global on the internet, and don't forget your TuneIn radio feed, tunein.com to get your free software, which will work on most of your portable devices like your mobile phones, your tablets, even your PCs and notebooks, and once you've installed the software, you can then for free uh, save all of your favourite alternative radio stations, hopefully Orion Talk Radio, and carry on listening. And don't forget, folks, if we get an outage or anything like that, denial of service on the main website and you can't tune in that way, we, ca- we are carried on the tuning feed, so you can just go to tuning.com, search at the top there for Orion Talk Radio and carry on your listening there. You've no need to miss anything as it, that feed is also operational for you. By the way, folks, you'll also find it appearing now on some home entertainment systems and also on car radios now. Great new feed and growing very fast, very easy to use on the move. Now, for archive purposes, today is Tuesday the 13th of August. Tuesday the 13th of August, so if you're listening to this show on an archive instead of a live show, you'll know where your MP3 came from. If you get them in a mix, <laughs> some of the guests do, they get in a pickle with them, and they can't ID the dates, they've lost the ID. That, this is the way, we give it out quite early on the show. So it's Tuesday the 13th of August for the live show. Now, my name is Kevin Ball. I'm broadcasting based in Dublin and Ireland. The show you know is Three Thinking Voice, the Earth News Rebel Show, and broadcast on Orion Talk Radio from New York. Today, I can tell you, I've been really looking forward to, because I've been talking to a gentleman for a while now uh, about uh, covering the subject as, he, as an expert, as he is, of borderline personality disorder. Now, it's a very complex subject for one thing, and you really need an expert to deal with this because there are so many facets and factors in this illness. It's often misdiagnosed as well for the same reasons. Well, we're fortunate because a gentleman's come forward, and that is Dr. David M. Allen, who, MD, who is a teaching professor, Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, 
and author of the book, this is his latest book, How Dysfunctional Families Spur Mental Disorders. Now, Dr. Allen is going to discuss his ideas about uh, borderline personality disorder in, in a lot of detail. And he's going to introduce today borderline personality di disorder to us all. So we're going to get a picture of this today. But before we start this, which is going to be, be a series, I wanted to give you some outline to understand where Dr. Allen is coming from. So I'm just going to read a short uh, sort of bio and introduction to give you a guide to this before I, I bring Dr. Allen on. Uh, David M. Allen, MD, is the author of the book How Dysfunctional Families Spur Mental Disorders. A balanced approach to resolve problems and reconcile relationships. He is Professor Emeritus and of Psychiatry and the former Director of Psychiatric Residency Training at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis, a position he held for 16 years. Prior to that, he was the private, pra uh, uh, he was the private practice in psychiatry in Southern California for 13 years during the advent of managed care health insurance. Additionally, he has done research into personality disorders and is a psychotherapy theorist. He is the author of three books for uh, psychotherapists, a family systems approach to individual psychotherapy, uh, deciphering motivation in psychotherapy and psychotherapy with borderline patients, an integrated approach, as well as numerous journals, articles and book chapters. He is a former associate editor of the Journal of Psychotherapy, Integration and a former treasurer of the Association of Research in Personality Disorders. He received his medical degree from UC San Francisco and his psychiatry residency at the Los Angeles County University of Southern California Medical Center. Now, I can tell you, we, we've posted the information for uh, Dr. Allen into the chat. As usual, folks, the way we work it, anything we refer to, if we can, videos, information, and this information is going to be in there for Dr. Allen, where you'll be able to pick up on his blogs, his websites, and videos even, and TV footage as well, as uh, uh, other footage and recordings that he's done teaching from the chat. So to find the chat, you go to orientalradio.com, select the chat tab at the top and from there you can basically search for the Earth Needs Rebels uh, chat on the list once you're in there on the live show Katie Research is there for you to poise any questions to or anything like that and we also have if you're on an archive just go to the chat the same go back chronologically in time to the date of the show and you'll still find the information there to link up to Dr. Allen because this is really good stuff. It's rare we get a chance to go in depth in a complex subject like this. And I know when I spoke to David earlier on, one of the main reasons he chose it was the complexity. It's a real teaser, I can tell you. But we've got the right chat with us in Dr. Allen. And before I go any further, I'm going to bring Dr. Allen onto the show. So Dr. David Allen, thank you so much for coming on to... Three Thinking Voice, the Earth News Rebel Show, broadcast on Orion Talk Radio. What a great chance we've got to get into BPD. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, honestly. I've enjoyed talking to you, Dr. Allen, when we've had the pre-show chats, and we've really gone quite a bit in depth to look at perhaps the best way to present this, because it's a difficult one. It's not like a subject where you're dealing with depression or anxiety as a single subject or something like this. This is very complex indeed, because it covers so many symptoms and facets within it uh, that make up the whole functional area that a, a patient might go through with uh, by, um, BPD. Now, when we had the pre-show chats, I think we sort of worked out probably the best way to do with this was for you to introduce your experiences of how you got into uh, borderline personality disorder and wanted to do something about this and then perhaps play a bit of tennis during this show to try and capture the experiences you've had and also to try and capture all the different facets that someone with borderline personality disorder might show to you as a, uh, a consultant or the other way around might experience themselves and wonder what's happening. So uh, possibly the best way to go might be the rather interesting introduction you gave to me when you explained how you got into um, uh, working with borderline personality disorder and your early experience was quite extraordinary. 
Well, uh, first of all, I, I want to give a little background. Uh, when I did my uh, psychiatry training back in the 1970s, psychiatrists were still doing therapy uh, as a main thing and mostly psychoanalysis. Uh, there was some smattering of behavioral therapies and uh, gestalt therapy and a few others were being practiced around, but the analysts were sort of the only game in town and the biological people were just starting to come on. And at that time during the 70s, uh, all my analytic supervisors, all my supervisors for psychotherapy were from the psychoanalytic school, and borderline personality disorder wasn't in the DSM. Uh, it didn't get in there until uh, 1980. Um, and I was sort of naive, and I had really no understanding of what it really meant to be a therapist. You thought, I thought maybe you just sat there and listened to people's problems and helped them cope better, but I didn't know that they kind of aimed them at you. Um, so I was in for kind of a shock. Um, like I said, the, the analyst had started talking about borderline personality disorder. It was called like pseudoneurotic schizophrenia and a bunch of strange things like that. And it wasn't in the book. It, thought, it was thought to be on the borderline between um, neurosis and psychosis, which later turned out not to be true. But the very first patient uh, I had in therapy uh, was a woman that was angry right from the minute she started with me. Um, she had been in therapy with the previous resident who rotated off the service, was a female, and uh, she was very upset about this. Uh, the, and the, the way she framed it was the last therapist was this goddess who was totally into her and kind of understand her. And, but she really wasn't all that great because she abandoned her and dumped her with me. And she basically spent the first maybe four or five sessions doing nothing but insulting me uh, for the entire 45 minutes. And uh, I was nonetheless taken aback, as you might guess. But she, of course, zeroed in on my uh, inexperience mostly. Uh, because she knew I was just starting out, so that was an easy thing to pick on. But she insulted everything, even my looks, you name it. Uh, and then she uh, went to my supervisor to complain that I was so terrible and that I was ruining her life. But uh, luckily he sort of knew about this condition, and he said that, well, you got to try and work it out with Dr. Allen first. Um, I'm not going to switch you to a different resident. Um, and then she started threatening suicide, and then, uh, you know, I threatened to, to call security. She said, well, I could just run out this room, and uh, I'd be gone before they got here, and I knew that was true, of course. Um, so I was feeling incredibly helpless, and I, you know, I didn't know exactly what to do. Obviously, I was feeling angry inside, but I knew not to kind of express that. Um, uh, but she kind of settled down after a while and stopped doing that. Um, so, uh, again, I didn't exactly know what I was dealing with until, until the end of the year when she started talking about what she was experiencing at the beginning of the year when she was insulting me. Uh, and this is what really kind of opened my eyes. And she wasn't talking in retrospect like, uh, oh, I realize now what I was doing. No, she was telling me what she was thinking at the time she was insulting me. And what she was thinking at the time was, this guy's amazing. He's not tossing me out of the office. Uh, so... Uh, to sum it up, she was admiring me the whole time she was insulting me. And I was sitting there going, why would anybody do that? I mean, it just seems so bizarre. Um, and I, I, I guess I'm an excitement judge, uh, junkie. People ask me why I uh, got interested in this particular condition. Um, well, because they're, they're very interesting, and I was, re and I was determined that I was going to figure out how not to feel helpless around them, because they were very good at making you feel either helpless, guilty, or angry. And they're also very good at uh, what, what we call in the field as boundary disturbances. So uh, a lot of unethical psychiatrists who sleep with their patients will pick them out because they're easy victims and lousy witnesses, uh, so they can get away with it. Uh, but sometimes they're very seductive, and they'll, uh, they'll ask you to, uh, you just need a ride to their hotel room, and then they invite you up. And you have to know, of course, that that's very unethical to do, but some people kind of fall for that even against their better judgment. Um, and those people that knew about this condition, most therapists didn't want to treat it. Uh, the analysts said they were basically unanalyzable, which I never knew what that meant. Um, so you couldn't, you couldn't really treat them. And I had no idea. I had another uh, patient that I, uh, when I just finished my residency, that I wanted to discharge from a hospital. And she said she didn't want to go home. And I said, well, you know, basically I took a hard line and said, well, you know, it's too bad. you got to go. And she, uh, she proceeded to try and kill me. Um, there was a, I was in an office away from the nurse's station. There was a lamp on my desk, and she smashed it and started coming out with me with the point. And then I... Uh, 
kind of grabbed it and we kind of uh, fell down to the floor and we're rolling around a bit and then she reached up to the phone and this is in the day when phones actually used to weigh something and she took it and tried to bash me over the head with it. Um, and I got that out of it. Finally, we rolled into the uh, hallway and the nurses heard the commotion and got her off of me. Um, now, again, I, I was like, why would anybody want to stay in a psychiatric hospital? I mean, that made absolutely no sense to me. That's uh, wrong. <laughs> And I realized, well, gee, I was kind of hard-nosed. That, that was really kind of my fault. I should have been a little more empathic and asked her, well, what's waiting for you at home that you're so afraid to leave? But I didn't know to ask that back then because my supervisors never taught me that part. Um, so uh, I was just totally mystified. Again, I was resolved that i got to figure these people out. Well, uh, let me just tell one more story that sort of finally got me interested in family dynamics. And this makes me sort of not the conventional wisdom, so I want to tell you know, listeners ahead of time that my point of view is definitely in the minority, although I'm not alone. Um, I was, when I first started private practice, um, I was accepting some hospital patients from this guy I went into practice with. And uh, early on, I heard this story about this 19-year-old woman. When she was brought in, it took like three psych techs to hold her down because she was fighting them. And uh, I had heard that she'd smashed every appliance and door in her house. She never hit anybody, as far as I knew. Um, so I went, I went to see her, and she was calm and pleasant. And uh, I don't know what possessed me, since I had no family therapy training, but I met with her and her mother. And uh, they got into an argument while I was listening to them talk, and it got pretty heated, and she started going into a rage. Well, what did her mother do when she started going into a rage? The mother sticks her nose in her face and starts to berate her. Well, before you could do anything, bam, uh, she hauled off and slugged her mother in the face and was then carted off by those three psych techs I told you about earlier. Um, and I was more interested in the mother's behavior than I was in hers. I mean, I knew this woman had been violent, and I had just met her. This woman and her mother had been living with her. Why on earth would she stick her nose in the patient's face and berate her? You ever hear the expression, you know, you're asking for it? Uh, exactly. Uh, so I was, you know, what's going on there? And later on, I deconstructed the argument to find out why she went into the rage. But I, again, I was, I figured this has something to do with family dynamics. I found out later that the reason there had never been any violence in the home toward people, as opposed to things, was that every time it got to that point, her, the patient's sister would start crying and acting out, and everybody, and they would, the two of them would stop fighting and attend to her. But in the hospital situation, the sister wasn't there. Um, so, again, the feeling of helplessness and wonder about why anybody would be asking, is this psychotic, uh, crazy? Um, and for a long time, one of the criteria for borderline was sort of transient psychosis. Well, I found out that they're never really psychotic. When you see a... a uh, you know, a five-foot woman attack an eight-foot cop, it's not that he, she thinks he's a Martian or anything. She knows he's bigger than her and is going to get the best of it. She just doesn't care. That's not really uh, psychotic. Um, and, you know, it's, it used to be that personality disorders were given their own sort of separate axis, we call them, uh, because they were not quite like other psychiatric conditions. They didn't seem to be due to brain pathology or they seem to be personality traits that kind of clustered together by more than one might predict by chance. And, uh, and they are sort of a Chinese menu is the way you diagnose them. They, you know, have, there's nine different criteria. You can have any five, six, seven, eight, or all nine. And it uh, turns out there's like 200 and some odd different ways to do that. So it's hardly a homogeneous group. Um, uh, and uh, now, of course, they've abolished the axial system in the new DSM-5 because nobody wants to attribute causation to anything. Um, but I, I really thought that it kind of was that personality disorders are not mental diseases in the same way that, like, schizophrenia is, although there are a lot of people that seem to think that. Well, anyway, so that's how I kind of got interested in them. And then people started they, – they, uh, people have the disorder often accused of distorting everything, and sometimes they do that. Uh, so that you could never get an accurate picture of what's going on. But some of the patients I had were annoyed that their prior therapists had accused them of that. So they started bringing in tapes, telephone conversations that they had recorded with their parents. And these are adults I'm talking about, talking with their parents, 
when the parents didn't know that they were being recorded. And I started listening to the tapes, and the most amazing thing started to come out that I would had never thought to even ask about uh, before. And what I find with a lot of these conditions is don't ask, don't tell. If you don't ask certain questions, patients don't volunteer this sort of information, especially if you don't seem interested in them. The first thing I noticed was that they were very good at getting me to sound just like their parents. Uh, I was just really impressed by how good they were at doing that. How did they do that? I mean, I sounded just like her mother right then. How, that, that was amazing. And then I, I remember something that the analyst talked about called projective identification, where uh, people, it's thought of as a defense mechanism, but it really involves two people, where people sort of project certain things into other people who then react according to the way that they're behaving. <laughs> um, so, and then I had to figure out, well, how am I going to counter that so, A, I don't sound like their parents, because that, obviously, the parents were just, seeming to add to the confusion, um, and what do I do when they try to make me feel either helpless, guilty, or angry, and how would I go about, you know, countering that and being more empathic to why they had the need to do that in the first place, and the more I developed these tricks, I found out that other, other people from other schools of thought use a lot of the same tricks, because that's the only way you can have these people as patients without having them kind of drive you crazy, I get in trouble with, with uh patients that have been diagnosed with a disorder when they hear me say that because they think I'm blaming everything on them, when really I'm not because the doc doctors ought to know how to respond to them. And it turns out it's not that hard to get them to quit uh, making you your life a mess. Uh, it's very difficult to get them to change the way they interact with everybody else. But if you know the tricks of the trade, like I said, all, all, the, uh, all the practitioners who deal with them from all the different schools, Marshall Linehan, uh, Masterson from psychoanalysis, um, they all use at the beginning the same kind of uh, techniques to get people to calm down and start telling them what's really going on. Then, then the different treatment paradigms start to diverge. We've, okay, got, so to, we've got around a minute to the break. So I don't want you to take us into an important bit where you're going to lose track in the break. So I'd soon you start that three minutes the other side and then go into it. But you've made, I'll just reflect back to you lightly, you've made a very good picture of the family unit that was starting to appear there where it's, uh, uh, where it's uh, reactive and counter-reactive in the different ways around the client. And also, if you're not careful, you can become part of the outer layer of that just by interacting with the client yourself. You, uh, they start to almost act out with you in the same as the family, I think you're saying. Yes. Uh, very much so. It's starting to build up a picture that you're picking up on quite early on. I find this fascinating. We're going to be going into the break in about 20 seconds to sort of pick this up the other side, but I think you're getting this across to listeners, that this isn't as simple uh, as something like depression or anxiety or anything like that. There are a lot of factors about this that he's almost trying to work out a chess game in the family unit, I think. You're going to take us that way anyway. Yes. So uh, we're going into the break now. The uh, bumper music starting now, and we're back in about three minutes, listeners, four minutes, with Dr. Allen to carry this on further, and I assure you you're going to find this absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Dr. Allen. We'll pick this up in about three minutes. Alternative Radio. We are OrionTalkRadio.com. At Orion Talk Radio, we're constantly working hard on your behalf. But the fight for freedom could not be fought without you. So we want to hear what you have to say at 888 272 4434. I just want to say thank you guys for doing what you're doing. My old radio station has completely failed me. Corporate news is nothing but talking points and propaganda, and uh, it's time that we thought for ourselves. It's about time we had a station that deals with the real truth, so thank you. The mainstream media lies to us. We all know it. Hi, I love listening to your station. I listen to you daily. I love the Orion Network. It is filled with great shows. I shared it with my friends, and we are devout listeners of Orion Radio. All I can say is I get what I need to know from Orion Talk Radio. 
At Orion Talk Radio, we're waiting for your call. 888-272-4434. IRN, USA News. I'm Mark Thomas. A federal appeals court ruled today the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has been violating federal law by delaying a permitting decision for the proposed nuclear waste project at Yucca Mountain, Nevada. By a two-to-one vote, a three-judge panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit ordered the commission to promptly decide to license the project or reject the application. The Obama administration on Monday launched a formal review of its electronic intelligence gathering that has come under widespread criticism since leaks by a former spy agency contractor. The White House said in a statement the Review Group on Intelligence and Communications Technologies will examine the technical and policy issues that arise from rapid advances in global telecommunications. President Barack Obama vowed to improve oversight of surveillance and restore public trust in the government's programs. This is IRN. USA News. Policies issued by American General Life Insurance Company, Houston, Texas. Not available in all states. For details, visit AIGdirect.com. Daddy, Daddy, do superheroes get cavities? I get asked a lot of questions. None of them really surprise me anymore. But my neighbor asked me recently if I knew that I could get a quarter million dollars of life insurance through AIG Direct for just $18 a month. I knew I needed to get life insurance, but I had no idea that protecting my family could be so affordable. With $250,000, my wife and kids would be taken care of if something ever happened to me. It could help pay the mortgage, the car payments, the groceries, dentist visits, karate lessons, college tuition, and for just $18 a month. I love my family, and it's a great feeling knowing that if they ever lost me, they won't lose everything else, too. Save up to 70% on term life insurance through AIG Direct. Call now for a free, no-obligation quote. It only takes five minutes, and you could... It's free. Call 1-800-501-5423. That's 1-800-501-5423. Israel has public. Why do over 50% of North Americans suffer from some form of chronic ailment? Could it be due to a toxic overload? It's time to take back your life. Get the lead out as well as the cadmium, mercury, and calcium. Extendivite is a garlic cayenne supplement with five other herbs that acts like a natural draino cleaning out the stored toxins, restoring your energy and youthfulness that we've lost. If you would like to live your life free of sickness, pain, or fear, then Extendivite is for you. Available in either capsules or liquid, you too can see why Extendivite is the number one heart drop available. To order, call 1-877-928-8822. That's 1-877-928-8822. Or visit our website at heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendivite. Imagine a world with natural clouds, clean air, clean water, and natural food. Why in the world are they spraying? If you love your family, if you love your children, if you love our planet, it's time to get involved. In 2010, millions of people were awakened to the question of what. Now the next question that remains to be answered is, why in the world are they spraying? An investigative look into one of the many agendas associated with chemtrail geoengineering programs, weather control. Why has our weather been changing? Are the long white lines in the sky changing our weather? Could there be a monetary and political agenda behind these damaging programs? Why in the world are they spraying? Order your copy today at www.whyintheworldarethespraying.com. Why in the world are they spraying? And if you control the weather, you're going to control the planet. It's that simple. Hi, this is Kevin Ball. Here at Revel, join me on the Earth News Rebel Show. Weekdays 1 p.m. Eastern, Saturdays 9 a.m., Sundays 8 a.m. to 12 on Orion Talk Radio. Listeners, welcome back to Three Thinking Voice, the Earth Needs Rebel Show, broadcast on Orion Talk Radio from Tonawanda, New York, 1650 on the AM, 
global on the internet, don't forget your tune-in radio feed. Check out The Sound of Freedom each weeknight from 8 to 10 p.m. Ryan Brooks breaks down all that is wrong with the state of our world and, more importantly, what you can do about it. Solutions-based radio each weeknight, 8 to 10 p.m., Monday to Friday, right here on the Ryan Talk Radio. That's new times for Ryan Brooks, 8 to 10 p.m., uh, for his show now, and don't forget Fridays is great phone in, folks. You'll really enjoy that. Great crowd of listeners there. Now, we're fortunate today to have um, Dr. David Allen, who is a consultant psychiatrist. He's also a teaching professor, and he's done many years, as you'll pick up uh, in, in, in the field, of working very closely with borderline personality disorder. And being a complex disorder, we just sort of gone through the first... Uh, half an hour of the show to introduce you to that and, and Dr. Allen's kindly given you three good stories of his experiences where he became the subject of some attention in this uh, with uh, BPD. The problem is, um, as you probably starting to pick up on, uh, that there are quite a lot of reactions around anyone with borderline personality disorder that are going to spin off on anyone that has very close contact with them, family members, partners, uh, you know, and as people go out, there's going to be a different effect. And, of course, when the psychiatrist steps onto the scene, and look what's happened to Dr. Allen, his introduction quote up quite early on in his career, got his curios- curiosity as he became the subject of almost a, t- well, a tax really around it. Quite extraordinary. What might help listeners a little bit, I want you to just give, if you would, uh, Dr. Allen, your contact information and your book details and where they can obtain that as a back of this. Although it's in the chat, would you give it all to our listeners now? Okay, well, uh, anybody can email me. My email is uh, dallen, A-L-L-E-N, 49, at comcast.net. Um, I also have two blogs, one on Psychology Today called uh, Matter of Personality uh, and another call that's more of my own uh, called uh, Mental Health and Family Dysfunction. Uh, and the, the links are on the, are on the page. So that those are, and my book, the last book is is really not on the subject of borderline personality disorder, but sort of on the trends and that I find uh, disturbing in the mental health field, uh, where everything's getting biologized. Uh, and that book's available at all booksellers, uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, any online bookseller. Um, so the books for therapists are also available at those same places. That's absolutely great. That's absolutely great. Now. And obviously, you know I'm a counsellor, so I've got a degree of ex- experience in this to see what you see in patients. But what we're trying to do today is obviously to try for the, as many listeners as we can to catch uh, as many as we can to be able to obtain an insight into this because it is not uncommon to have this disorder. It is about, and um, understanding it might help people protect themselves from it if they understand how this can happen then uh, when working with families and that over the generations that knowledge from someone as an expert as Dr. David Allen might just give you an idea of things that could happen that would make the path better rather than getting in the pickle in the first place and then finishing up with someone like Dr. Allen sorting it all out with the family getting it all back together it would be a lot easier if the education is there. So that is a big feature of what Dr. Allen's doing by coming and cutting series with us. And I think that's great. So I'm going to intervene at this point, in, and just before Dr. Allen continues, as listeners are going to ask a couple of questions that haven't got any experience of this, they're going to be asking uh, about what are these interactions and counteractions. We're talking projection and counteract projection, which are terms regularly used as basic uh, terms, but you've got more advanced terms than that, obviously, to describe the type. And also, there will be transference involved here, where you see someone acting out around another person that was never part of these reactions, who then starts to function, be it defensively or reactively, to the client in such a way they become like the family. Well, well yes, I think, uh, but they don't, I wanted to make a point, they don't, uh, people with Personality disorders, despite what you may hear, don't always act like that. They only act like the way I'm describing in certain types of relationships. Uh, I've had occasion to see people that I knew were like people that cut themselves or had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder uh, at uh, rock shows and uh, outside in the park. And when they weren't, they didn't know they were being watched, and you'd never know. I mean, they act completely Normally, they're very friendly. They're very likable. Um, you have no idea. But if you uh, are a lover 
uh, or a family member or a therapist in particular, uh, then you're more prone to get that. And if you're just a friend, you're, you're somewhat prone, but you're less likely to get it. And if you're just acquaintance, you, like I said, you'd have absolutely uh, no idea that that was going on. But unfortunately, therapists think that these people act this way 24-7. Uh, they just have to act that way in several contexts in order to qualify as having a personality disorder, but not in all contexts. It's not something that is like schizophrenia where it doesn't matter what the environment is or, or real bipolar disorder. If you're in a manic state, uh, there was a movie, Silver Linings Playbook, uh, which I, the, the psychiatrist seemed to like, but I was kind of bothered by it because it portrayed a manic patient. Her, his love interest said something pertinent, and he kind of came out of the mania. That doesn't happen. But with, with somebody who's uh, acting out in a borderline way, that certainly can happen. So it's a very, very different uh, sort of thing. It, it, we also know it can't be genetic because it, the frequency, the, uh, the prevalence of the disorder has been going up since the 70s. Like I said, it wasn't even in the book until 1980. And, uh, and this was at a time when uh, the psychoanalysts were in charge of the American Psychiatric Association. They were interested in personality disorders. And it's kind of hard to miss, as you might have gathered from my um, uh, <laughs> descriptions of my interactions. So I don't think it was because they, they just weren't aware of it. Um, I think it was just a lot less um, common then than it is now. Now it's a... Figures range about two to three percent of the population, and much higher in, in people that come to psychiatrists and and uh, therapists. Um, so, and the gene pool has not changed drastically in the last fifty years. It just doesn't happen that quickly. I, I wanted to just capture a point that you sort of uh, gone over twice. You quite clearly indicating this that uh, there seems to be a tie up uh, in borderline personality disorder between how well the, a person knows a person and the the triggering of it. So uh, people that are closer and they have greater familiarity with, like uh, partners and family members, are going to get a very different reaction from this person due to, I'm presuming, the typical projection and transference elements of this getting much more intense as they do anyway uh, with familiarity because people get to know the facets of each other. So you can get into a cycle of counter of reaction and counter reaction easier. Is that the reason that it happens when they're familiar? And they can appear completely normal with acquaintances. Well, I think so. Again, I'm, I have to give, uh, you know, truth and packaging. Most people do not agree with me about this, but a lot of what they do, not all of it, certainly their misery is real. And when you're in a rage, like I said, you don't want to be around it, but sometimes they kind of feign some of these things. Um, I, I find once you get familiar with the family dynamics that they're giving their parents what the parents what they think their parents need, and this is true even when they grow up and become adults. Um, and if you act, and again, it has to do with people that try to help them in particular. <laughs> um, if you try to help them, you're you're apt to get a lot of this behavior, and that's what therapists uh, are supposed to be doing, right? It's supposed to be helping them. So of course, they're more likely to get it than somebody who's not trying to help them. In fact, uh, there's a, a very famous couples type in the couples therapy literature where you have a female with borderline personality disorder. And at least in clinical samples, about 70 to 80% of people with the disorder are female. That may be because the males with the disorder ha have more sociopathic, antisocial behavior and don't come because I think they're out there. But we see mostly female, but well, they'll attract something uh, that's called narcissistic personality disorder uh, in, in their spouses. The narcissistic people are those that seem to always want to take charge of everything and they're starved for attention and always want to be admired and uh, always want to be in, char in control and feel entitled and everything. And the borderline is basically, uh, or I should say a person with borderline personality disorder, because, again, some people don't, don't like it when you use an adjective as a noun, because we don't want to uh, stigmatize these people. Uh, they're basically help-rejecting complainers who uh, refuse to admire you for anything uh, often. So it, that becomes a very explosive situation, and that's where you get a lot of violence. And it's usually the man against the woman, but not always. Um, yes. And I, I can't make a diagnosis on a, on, you know, on a news story, but there was a story about a woman that cut off her husband's penis. Uh, again, I don't know if she uh, was an example of this, but, you know, uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Let me put it that way. Now, uh, I, I noticed you made a, a comment there, which we covered in pre-show as well. Um, I'm going to put the same to you as I did in pre-show, that um, there is a tendency with BPD for their partners to display 
uh, more on the narcissistic side of things. Now, I'm going to ask you the uh, question on this. Could this be two ways? One is that the, there could be a, an attraction that way around from day one and that person could start that way. Could it also that um, people who are starting to get damaged in a relationship with someone with BPD adapts in the day, way of shutting down their feelings in a narcissistic way to try and minimise the damage and actually develops it within the relationship? Well, that's kind of a complicated question. Yes, they do that to some extent, but they'll also sacrifice themselves and cause themselves a lot more misery. Um, again, I, I would have to get into the theory and the family dynamics here. I'm not ready to get to that point yet. But um, they'll, they'll often put themselves in a situation where they will be damaged uh, by a situation. I had uh, one of those narcissistic borderline kind of couples where uh, the guy had been very violent, hyper-jealous, and obviously had low self-esteem. And his, uh, his wife decided one day she was angry at him, so she torched his prize vehicle. She slept with his best friend. She then uh, went and told him all about it and blamed it all on his inadequacies as a husband. And I always say at this point, well, guess what happened next? And everybody says in unison, he beat her up. Well, yes, <laughs> that's exactly what happened. But she knew that. Now, this I'm not blaming her. He has no right to beat her up no matter how much he's provoked. But... To say that she had nothing to do with it is not really a fair statement either uh, because she, she, again, you're asking for it. People give it to you. Um, so that's certainly not making her feel better by doing this, but in another way it does because it, it helps her fulfill the role that she's adopted in her family of origin. And that, that's interesting because I've, I've seen what you're talking of. Uh, and what you're talking of is almost, it looks like the person's doing something that is emotionally suicidal, physically suicidal, to go ahead in that path. You're asking, and sometimes it is, yeah. Yes, it is. And you're yeah. asking your question why. And they, they are very driven in this direction. Uh, to the point it looks like goading, doesn't it? It really looks like goading. Yes. Y yes, it does. And then you left with a question, then, what rationale would drive someone to do that? What's the thirst, or what are they running away from to go in this direction? Well, that's what, that's what was driving me crazy for a long time until, uh, again, I did a lot of reading in a lot of different schools of thought and then started to actually interview family members, <laughs> which was the next step is bringing the parents in and meeting with the patient and the parents. I've had, uh, I was a, a training director, so I also supervised residents. I had one situation where the resident was seeing the mother of a patient with the disorder and another resident was seeing uh, the patient. And I had videotapes comparing the way them describing the same interactions. And when you start doing that, you start seeing the most, again, the most amazing thing. And then I had the parents of, of borderline patients. I had the mother that got beaten up, by, got slugged by her patient as a patient herself. Uh, and she had a lot of borderline traits as, as well. Um, so I started to find out what was going on. And then one of the last theorists that I came across as I was trying to figure this out, was a fellow by the name of uh, Murray Bowen, who was a family systems therapist, and he talked about how these patterns develop over three, at least three generations, sometimes more. So then we started doing something called the genogram, where we would trace back the experiences of the parents with the grandparents and uh, figure out what, you know, it's, it's, a, it's one thing to say that the patient with the disorder is reacting to the parents. But then that just brings the next question up, which is, well, why on earth would the parents be acting that way? You know, why would the mother, in my, one of my examples earlier, stick her nose in the patient's face when she knew that she'd probably get hit? Uh, it, just, it just kicks the question down the line. Uh, and everybody who's looked at the family dynamics, and very few researchers have, seems to find similar things. The people that don't believe in this stuff really have never looked at it. You know, because they don't ask these questions. And, again, it's don't ask, don't tell. If you don't ask these kinds of questions, if you don't know what the questions are ahead of time, you're not going to hear about a lot of this stuff. So people will then say, oh, well, you're just, you're just hearing what people think you want to hear. Well, what I, want, what I want to hear is really counterintuitive. They would have no way of knowing unless they read my book, and some patients actually have, but it doesn't seem to make a lot of difference. Uh, they would have no way of knowing what I, quote, wanted to hear. And if they were doing that, the story starts to fall apart. They're, they're, there's like a, it's like a movie with plot holes. It, it just doesn't, things don't add up. And one of the techniques that we use is to very empathically point out that 
the patient sort of contradicted himself, and we don't understand that. We, we do it from a kind of position where, help me to understand this. You said A, but then you seem to have contradicted with B, so maybe they're both true, but I don't, you know, help me understand this. Um, there's some way we call that the Columbo style of questioning after the uh, detective on a TV show that always got the uh, murderers to admit uh, what they did by playing stupid, basically, um, and have them clear up the confusion, and then the, the real story would come out. And then I could confirm it with the relatives when I brought them in, uh, one at a time, usually. I, I can't follow all, I can barely follow the action then. Uh, some people can do family therapy and watch the action when there's four or five people in the room. I, I really admire those people because uh, it hap everything happens so fast that uh, I don't know how they follow it. Uh, it's hard enough to follow with one person in the room. Um, so people that have looked at this find out that they see the same thing. And a lot of it's sort of simple way of looking at things, like the issue of child abuse, for instance, always comes up. Now, it's very clear that not all people with the disorder were physically or sexually abused when they were kids, and that most people who have been physically or sexually abused as children do not go on and become people with borderline personality disorder. So um, that have, having been that said, if we look at any risk factor, and there are no single causes for any psychiatric disorder, there are only risk factors. There are no necessary or sufficient causes for anything in the DSM. There are always how many risk factors do you have? And if you look at all the risk factors that have been discovered for the disorder, uh, certainly childhood abuse and particularly psychological abuse uh, is the most common of any biological, psychological, or social risk factor you care to look at. Uh, but it can't just be the abuse or how bad the abuse was even or even the perpetrator. You have to look at, well, what was said to the kid while he was being abused? What was the relationship like with the abuser when the abuse wasn't happening? Uh, it's interesting that we accuse our patients with the disorder of doing something called splitting, where they can only see people as all good or all bad, when in fact that's what the therapist is really doing. So you, the therapist thinks of a child abuser, it's like that's the sum total of their existence. They couldn't possibly have done anything good in their life because it's so, what they did bad was so horrendous, it's got to completely overshadow anything good they might have done. Well, if you're growing up in a household and your dad treats you very nicely except when he's raping you, uh, that's very confusing, okay? <laughs> and it's what's going on in the house, what the mother's doing, what the father is saying, what their relationship is like outside of that situation, and all that that's more important than any single element in the picture. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm following you, Dr. Allen, totally. I'll just reflect back to you at this stage uh, where you are. You, you're quite clearly um, painting a picture of um, the... When you're looking at the reactions to people, I'll, I'll probably put something else in here which, which we haven't covered at this stage, which will be part of this. Um, to, to the bystander who has, uh, is not have the problems of this condition and their feelings are normal, they have a, a lot of empathy for others. And the last thing they want to do is hurt anyone and do anything like that. Even when we get angry, uh, we tend to lose empathy during the anger. But... Uh, well, afterwards, we, we're really upset if we've got angry. We apologise. It's quite natural, isn't it? Yeah. But, of course, people with BPT, it's not quite like that. This can go on. They, you, you can start off with something quite minor, like you described the couple where she goes out and sleeps with his best friend, does all these things, then comes back. Well, you sort of say, well, where's the empathy, empathy here? Do, and I'm, when I say that, I'm talking of both cognitive and affective empathy, because... Of course, it could be either way. To, they could have awareness of the other person and choose to ignore it like a sociopath would. Or they, they might not have the worst awareness. It might be innocent. Or they might be completely able to empathise uh, both uh, effectively and uh, uh, cognitively and still, for some reason, be able to um, step past the feelings of guilt and responsibility afterwards. What's happening in this little bit with people with BPD in the mechanics of these elements that we all, the rest of us, seem to function normally? Well, again, that's a very complicated question, and I'm going to have to get into the family dynamics a little bit uh, to answer that question. 
So bear with me here. I don't know if we have time before the top of the hour break, but uh, let, let me get we kind of started. Um, to give you a clue, I'm sorry I'm jumping ahead on the, some of the complex yeah. questions. It's just trying to ease you forward because I know how in depth the knowledge is, Alan. Uh, <laughs> <Don't try Yeah. laughs> so we're going into the break at 56.50, just beyond. So we've got about a minute for you to for a short reflection back, and then we've got the break on the news out until seven minutes past, which we can cut in. So if you want to introduce something lightly at this point for the next minute, that would be great. Well, I want to mention just something briefly, which I'll explain later. There's a, a concept from evolutionary psychology called sim- kin selection, and it's only uh, accepted by maybe 20% of evolutionary biologists, but not because it isn't valid, because it's politically incorrect. But uh, it explains a lot of the family behavior, so maybe after the break I can kind of... Uh, start off with that theory and very simply put and i'm going to be oversimplifying it uh, obviously but at least we'll get the point across and then describe uh, what happens in the families of borderlines that leads to them having the problem that you just described so well where they they seem to have empathy but yet they they do things like this um often at their own extent usually at their own expense even when they're being uh abusive it usually just brings hate onto them. It, uh, it may cause a lot of pain to other people as well, but uh, it doesn't really do them any good to have people hate them. Absolutely. I mean, it, it is when you're actually watching it in a client and you're seeing the situation, we're going into the break now, Dr. Allen, but you can visibly see as they become slightly more heated, uh, you can see like with uh, resentment and feelings coming from wherever, their empathy is rolling off so fast and then it's not there. And then it can become a little bit dangerous, as you've already demonstrated in the first half hour. So we're going into the news break, folks, and we're going to have uh, Dr. David Allen with us after the news break at seven minutes past the hour to continue a little bit more in depth on BPD. Thank you. Are you or someone you know suffering from high blood pressure, cholesterol, or chest pains? Are you looking for a more natural way to overcome these health challenges? Extendivite is made from herbs known to help with these symptoms. Made from garlic, cayenne, hawthorn, and four other herbs, Extendivite goes to work detoxifying heavy metals and killing fungus and virus to enhance your overall health. For only $69.95 plus shipping and handling for a two-month supply of either capsules or liquid, you too can begin on your path to better health. For more information, call 1-877-928-8822. That's 1-877-928-8822. Or visit our website at heartdrop.com. Since 9-11, the people of the United States have sadly witnessed the largest transformation in our nation's history. And since then, we've collectively been terrorized over and over again. 